principles. We always encourage you to lose count of your blessings. Trying to focus on all that God has given us builds our uh, gratitude for His love and builds our trust that He will take care of us. But it's possible that in our focus of all the blessings that He has given, that we overlook what is truly our greatest portion. Within our mini-series on Psalm 16, and we're already halfway through, uh, we've learned so much, particularly that God is the good giver of all good things. We've also learned to make sure that our hearts always only delight in the giver more than the gifts, lest anything become an idol. And to further that idea in much more depth, our third lesson focuses on the teaching of verses 5 and 6. Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Okay, what exactly does that mean? What's in his mind? What's he thinking? Even though the essence can be carried across, it means more to us when we study it. So let's ask some soul-searching questions that may help us apply this message. It may be that these questions relate to you and bring something in your own life to the table and the discussion. So listen to these careful, soul-searching questions, and then we will let the psalmist help answer those questions. Are we as grateful or content with our blessings as we need to be or as we could be? Do we become worried or even angered over the denial or eventual loss of some of those blessings? Is it really God we are trusting to take care of us? When we hear that the Lord will bless us, are we mainly thinking about materialistic things? When we hear that He will take care of us, do our thoughts limit that promise to only this life? And if you read the article attached to the emailed outline, this, less, this question will relate to you or be fresh in your mind. Do we view our faithfulness as obligating God to give us the best, best luxuries of this life? Well, just a little study of these two verses will help answer all of these questions. And as if we are receiving a new set of prescription spiritual lenses for the, that we are desperately in need of, David is going to help us see how abundantly supplied we already are and what our portion truly is. Certainly, our loving Father provides for His children and blesses cheerfully His children in a variety of ways. Absolutely, He does. But in matters of what is most important, the righteousness we have in Him and the relationship with Him that He sacrificed to give us, God's primary purpose for us is neither to, to be in wealth or to live in poverty, as some might suggest, but, it's, but his primary purpose is for us to be holy. To be like him, to be like God who alone is holy. So it is him we seek and it is him we faithfully follow. This is why and how the Hebrew writer could say what he did and command us in chapter 13 verses 5 and 6. Let your conduct, your whole life and even your thoughts be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, because the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly be able to say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Our life's purpose for holiness then is not measured by the abundance or the absence of our material possessions, but rather in our condition of heart our manner of conduct in Christ. And in all the things that we do to glorify God, He may allow our work and our plans to be greatly blessed with the things of this world. Conversely, 
It could be that despite all of our efforts, we seem to always get only enough to get by. (laughs) You know what? I don't want to sound trite. Those who were described largely by last Wednesday's class as having a great capacity for compassion may even have a hard time with this entire lesson, but this is an aspect of truth that, that we need to all mature to. What's my response to this, no matter what our circumstance? So what? Right? I mean, so be it. We are satisfied, aren't we? Okay. Whether we are or currently not, and still working on it, thankful that God is merciful as he gives us time to grow, we can admit that the message of Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, and Psalm 16, 5 and 6, is not always easy to accept and live and believe and feel. We can also see, though, and agree that the souls who truly embrace and believe and live by this understanding end up having a jubilant peace and contentment that far surpasses the understanding of those of this world. I want you to imagine being always truly satisfied. Despite the frustrations and the trials you go through. That doesn't seem to work together, but it's true in the spiritual sense. Always being satisfied despite the trials and frustrations solely because God is ours. We have Him. He has us. He sustains us. He's our portion. Again, let's focus on our text today, Psalm 16, 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Before our primary point for the lesson, I want to mention we don't know in David's life where he was during this time. It could have been his flight before King Saul. It could have been before his rebellious son Absalom, or perhaps something undocumented. But it appears that David's future is in jeopardy, his possessions are up for grabs, his inheritance is in question, and his very life is in peril. He's going through a lot right now, and yet David can say, Lord, I know that whatever happens here, it's going to be all right. I'll be more than all right, because you are my portion my cup, my lot, whether you decide to place me on the throne of Jerusalem or to die in exile. I still have the best lot, the most beautiful inheritance. I have you, God. How exceedingly blessed are his people who learn this heavenly truth while still here. The point can be concluded at this, but our understanding is enhanced with a little background study. Verses 5 and 6, our vision can be sharpened with this one word background summary, Levites. (laughs) That's the answer to the background study, Levites. David is using Levitical terms because he now understands how the portion that that they were given was actually the best. The most preferred. After Israel conquered uh, the promised land, their portion of it, it was divided among the tribes. These tribal land allocations were passed from father to son. And the generations would refer to those land allocated inheritances as God's inheritance for them. So notice in Joshua 14 verse 2, it says that these were handed out to the tribes By lot, as God commanded Moses. We know that there were 12 tribes, and of course, uh, the Joseph factor was involved, but there was one tribe that did not receive any land inheritance. One tribe was excluded, the tribe of Levi. They had to settle for cities in everyone else's lands. Why? That doesn't sound fair. (laughs) We might notice it was first because of discipline. Yes, we'll get to that verse. But, but we will also consider how those other important messages in each verse were also repeated for emphasis. It tells us something that we need to pay attention to. Let's notice the verses listed in order. I'm just going to read the first half of them. Numbers 18.20 You shall have no inheritance in the land, neither shall you have any portion among them. Ooh, that sounds stern. 
Deuteronomy 10, 9, Therefore Levi had no portion or inheritance with his brothers. Wow. Joshua 13, 14, The tribe of Levi alone Moses gave no inheritance. Joshua 13, 14. Again in verse 33, But to the tribe of Levi Moses gave no inheritance. Okay, let's focus on some answers here. Genesis 49, 5-7. Enjoy reading those on your own time in the backstory. Levi with Simeon promised were promised that his descendants would be scattered among Israel because they were violent men who wrongfully took vengeance on Shechem and made their father, I like the word, odious, uh, re, re, uh, re, uh, repulsive in the eyes of the people and the natives there. Can you imagine how difficult though this was, this punishment was? To all of the descendants, seeing everyone else have their great inherited portions of land and lot that you have no entitlement to. Even Joseph's children had a portion. This could seem cruel. In fact, in their temple service, they depended on the brethren's obedience to God's will of contribution to keep them alive. It could easily seem like they got the short end of the stick, that others got the better deal. Well, maybe, maybe not. How did God turn the punishment on Levi and Simeon into a greater blessing for the descendants? Mention the temple service. Their unique roles of the, of the Levitical tribe kept them focused on the laws and worship of God. They dwelt daily on what God had said. Just what had God said to them? This time, let's go through the same order of verses and emphasize not the land that they did not get, but the lot that they got. In order listed, for I am your portion. I am your inheritance. The Lord is his inheritance and I think a theme is being repeated here. The offerings by fire of the, to the Lord God of Israel, their worship, is their eternal inheritance, right? The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance. Is it accurate or could it be fair to suggest that in a time when every temporal thing in David's life is, that's being threatened, that he can now more clearly see that the portion, the cup, the inheritance the Levites received is in fact the best lot. For him, it's what he chose to be that for himself. Folks, the world's powers, the world's prominent positions and riches, even prestigious properties are only temporary. They're not going to last. But... To be proclaimed just. To stand righteous in the presence of the only holy God forever and ever and ever and ever is truly the greater portion. So it's time for us to improve the title of this lesson. I did not like to click save or print on this because I just don't like the phrase, God is enough. There's something, with further study, there's something wrong with that phrase. Let's change that and make it like it needs to be. God is not merely enough. He is more than enough. David is of the tribe of Judah. And he understands that whatever God was leading him to, whether God was leading him to lie down in green pastures or beside still waters or walking through the valley of the shadow of death, God was with him. So, okay. That means God is more than all of that. God is more than anything. God is more than enough. A bonus verse for you in the updated outline. Matthew 5, 5. Write that in. The meek. The meek truly inherit this world. I find that interesting. They enjoy all blessings that they have or don't have even now more because more than the world that wants to take possession of things in a covetous, carnal-minded manner, the meek know that they can never truly own it. It all belongs to God. And they have God. Oh, they don't covet the things of this world, but they certainly praise God for their enjoyment of the blessings that he affords now within it. 
to complement the article again supplied. Pure Christianity does not try to baptize carnality. That's just not going to happen. His people pursue him. And on a related note, I don't want any of this to sound trite. I do want it to be helpful. I honestly want us to think like David. And I want, as I think about what my desire is for each of you, I want you to have good things. I want the best, of course. And, and we do have that, but I want good things throughout this life. And yet, I have to remind us, and I have to preach to myself daily, Christianity is not an entitlement ticket to get every temporal blessing we might prefer. We might legitimately delight in the Lord, serving Him with our all cheerfully, and yet still not get that job, that promotion, or ever be able to afford that nice car, or even find that godly spouse, or live in that great house where the rooms are filled with your kids or grandkids, and be set for retirement with only smooth days ahead. That's not what Christianity is about. That's not about the gospel's message of soul salvation. Cause and effect, living properly, being a good steward, yes, that lends blessings, but we're in a very sin-filled world, owned and operated by the devil, as we can see that clearly. What would my Psalm 16, 5 through 6 response be to any of those conditions where I really greatly want something and I just don't get it, have it. It's not going to happen. What, how am I to react to things that I had and then they're gone? How do I feel towards God? How do I feel towards the situation? What's my Psalm 16, 5 through 6 response to all of this? Again, not to sound trite, but just right. Oh well, whatever. It's okay. Because God is my portion, and I'm satisfied with Him. I've got to say quickly, I think this is a lesson better learned the longer we live it. We believe it, we've got to live it, then we better understand it. I want to remind us promptly that the Lord knows His children, and He knows just what we need when we need it. Trust Him. Have you ever paired up the verses Matthew 5, 6 and 6, 33? If we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and that's what we are craving, then guess what? We will be abundantly filled. We will be filled with Him. The god filled are more than satisfied. No matter the trial, no matter the tribulation, let's never forget that God is more than enough because our lines have fallen in good places and our inheritance is truly beautiful. I think about Hebrews 11 and to build up to this, you know, our, um, our focus affects our feelings, right? How we feel, what we're focusing on affects how we're feeling. And our feelings do affect our ability to function and how well we function or not. What are we focusing on every day? Think of the metaphorical mountains that would move for the Lord and with His help in Rome, Georgia, as I think of what point Lucian made in his class just last hour, if we, as His people, more of us at Oak Hill, better see... Believe and truly live like God is our only joy, our only hope, our only heart's delight in the only holy, all holy God who keeps filling our overfilling cup of full satisfaction. If we felt that and lived it and believe it, how much more effective would we be and how would we feel every day? How would we react to things in this world circumstantially? Wow. I want you to be encouraged by these examples in Scripture. If you want to open your Bible or tap to Hebrews 11, I won't read the verses, but I will refer to them. Let these examples encourage you and challenge you. 
verse 8. Verse 8, Abraham was able to leave all he knew and let God guide him. And in, in, in a land where he did not know life-threatening situation to do that back then because God promised to be with him and God is more than enough. Abraham was able to endure all of those 25 plus childless years just because he was holding on to the promise. And having the word of a faithful God is more than enough. Verses 17 through 19, Abraham was able to reach the point of committing to sacrifice his only promised child. He reached that point. God had to hold him back. We know how that story went. God matured him. It was proven. It needed to occur, that part of it. And God supplied what he needed for the worship. God supplies. God's more than enough. He was able to reason that God could even raise the dead if he follows through with God's will. That's faith. That's trust. Incredible. Verses 24 through 26, Moses could abandon all the pleasures of Egypt once he learned of how Jehovah is the God with his people, and he was one of them. Verse 35, do we ever wonder how so many could, and I've spent some time thinking about this, but my brain does not want to spend much time thinking about this, and yet I think it's good to spend time thinking about this. Do we wonder how so many could see their spouses, their children, be put to death for the cause of the faith of Christ and still be faithful themselves when so many people turn their back on Christ at the mildest inconvenience or offense? How could they do that? Because they knew God, and God could resurrect them. His resurrection power is more than enough. Verses 35 through 37 again. How did so many endure the torture, even refusing release, if they would just deny God? Because they knew God. They endured the mocking, the flogging, the chains, the imprisonment, the stoning, the being sawn in two, and... Killed by the sword because they knew that through it all, God was with them. And God is more than enough. Verse 37, a key focus. Many had to be content with being dressed in sheepskins and goatskins. Not just as their common clothing, but it would be sometimes attached to them before the games. And they would be mutilated by animals. How could they be content with this? They knew those garments weren't desirable. They knew they were spiritually clothed in God's righteous garments of royalty. Verse 38. Could we also be content dwelling in deserts and mountains and dens and caves? Well, would not be preferable, but maybe if we like them understood like they did that God was dwelling with them. That would help so much. In the words of Paul, I, well, I look at his own testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. He had to let these people know what he went through. How did he endure the hunger, the thirst, the sleeplessness, all of those beatings that we learned about recently in class, all of those imprisonments, and being in constant danger of the, not only the natural world, but the evil men around within the world? How could he handle the shipwreck? All that time just adrift at sea, all of this in the service of God. If we'd have went through this, we'd be thinking, if this is what service to God is, I don't know if I want it. But he knew that no matter what was taken from him, sleep, food, clothing, covering, housing, safety, uh, freedom, and comfort, no one could separate him from the love of God. Romans 8. And God is more than enough. Listen to Paul's own words in Philippians chapter 3. I'll be reading from the ESV in this case. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. I love how that English wording conveys well the meaning of the original text. That is beautiful. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Everything else is lost. 
For the sake, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, in him, not having a righteousness of my own that, it, that comes from the law. Think about who writes this. This is Paul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, coming in knowledge of Christ. For him to write this, it means so much more. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God. This is God's righteousness given to us that depends on faith. My loyal devotion and adherence to follow Him. I did something that uh, I encourage you to do from time to time. I almost didn't share it, but I thought, let's go ahead, because I do this, and it might be fun for you to see the type of fun I have uh, behind the scenes. I like to type key lines from songs and psalms and other key verses, and then just arrange them to speak a complete thought of my own. You might notice if these are songs, psalms, or both. Lord, I want you to reign in me. So create in me a clean new heart, because you mean more to me than any earthly thing. I have no good apart from you. My inheritance is great, because my very portion is you. In your presence is fullness of joy. My heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh will also rest in hope, because your love means more to me than any earthly thing, and your love is more than my mind can fathom. Whew. That last line is the theme of our encouragement song. But since this week's uh, new carefully selected song is itself a powerful, simple but powerful petition, it will play at the end of our service. The sacrifice of Jesus proves how much he loves us. The resurrection proves that his promises are true. For the gospel's blessings to be yours now depends on you. God blesses and God cheerfully provides for his children in many ways every day. But never forget what your inheritance is. Is never forget just what? No, no. Never forget just who your inheritance is, who it is that you have as your portion. We encourage baptism into Christ for the remission of sins that is commanded by Scripture. And if that be your need, let us know. But we hope that this lesson has encouraged you by personal resolve and commitment to be more satisfied ultimately in Him so that you can live that Psalm 16, 5 through 6 life as His people, His child. Thank you for letting this lesson bless you.